Oh, there's so much news happening right now. Unfortunately, it's all the same, really. Uh, coronavirus is being a dick, the economy is fucked, and our favourite failed state is in the final stages of an election battle between a creepy alleged sex offender and a creepy self-confessed sex offender. But 2020 has rendered me completely immune to bad news and all of this nonsense. I have lost all sense of normalcy. Fortunately, I don't cover that shit on this channel, and therefore I will just look at the shiny shiny, so we start with gravitational waves. Oh yes, we have just detected a rather smashing event involving two black holes colliding. The LIGO Virgo crew detected the resultant gravy waves back in May of 2019. The reason why this event is so significant is that normally the signal is pretty small, but this time it was really quite loud. And this is because of the size of the objects involved. The progenitor black holes were 85 and 66 solar masses, and the resultant black hole was 142 times as massive as the sun, and it shed some light on the formation of larger black holes. Through the traditional model of stellar evolution, we see stars between 2.5 and, and 130 times the mass of the sun collapse down to black holes of, around, of up to 65 solar masses. The issue is that more massive stars will produce photons of such high energy that they can create electron-positron pairs, and this impacts the dynamics, and when a star goes supernova, it doesn't leave a remnant, until you reach stars which are about 200 times the solar mass, and these puppies will collapse down to a black hole of at least 120 solar masses. This means that if the theory is correct, we shouldn't see any black holes between 65 and 120 solar masses from a single star collapse, and this range is called the mass gap. Keen observers may have noticed that the progenitor black holes sit in this mass gap. However, this detection shows that it is perfectly feasible to have black holes in this mass gap due to mergers. The leading idea at this moment is that the progenitor black holes observed in this merger are themselves results of mergers. However, this raises many questions, and it is still early days for this kind of astronomy. I suppose that it must be stressed that the detection of gravitational waves is not just excellent evidence for the theory of general relativity. It also creates a new discipline in astronomy. Gravitational wave astronomy will allow us to probe the universe in new ways that will allow us to get a better picture. Like many scientists, I'm actually hopeful that gravy wave astronomy will be the thing that finally reveals the cracks in this irritatingly good theory known as general relativity. Going from the very big, we will now look at some small stuff, and I have to give credit to Ken Wheeler for highlighting this one to me. Well, actually, I have to give credit to Aaron Drabbit for sending me the link to Ken Wheeler's video where he talks about this. It is fucking astounding how someone who rejects the notion of photons and quantum mechanics, uh, how he can claim that this somehow confirms their nonsense. But anyway, some people at the LHC did a thing. By accelerating protons up to stupid high speeds, because, well... That's what the LHC does, and getting the proton beams to graze each other, some interesting stuff happens. What happens is that protons interact via the electromagnetic force, which is carried by photons. Classical electrodynamics tells us that light doesn't interact with light. However, quantum electrodynamics tells a different story. And it is a freaky rare event, but what happens is that quasi-real photons generated by the protons collide to produce W boson pairs, and the W boson is the force carrier of the weak interaction, and they decay down to electrons and muons. The W boson was theorized by Sheldon Glasher, Steven Weinberg, and Mohamed Salem, and they won a Nobel Prize for their theory that the electromagnetic force and the weak force actually are the same thing at high energies, and this is described by electroweak theory. In fairness, this electroweak theory is old hat now, and there exists plenty of evidence for it, but this particular result confirms a big prediction which was observed during the first run of the LHC between 2011 and 2012, but at the time the data set was not good enough to get a significant result. The second run just really smashed it, and they got a result with 8.4 sigma significance. And we can now say with confidence that the gauge bosons, which are the photons, W bosons, or Z bosons, or basically this bit in the standard model, interact as predicted by electroweak theory. But this also opens the possibility of testing physics beyond the standard model through photon-photon collisions. A really high-resolution picture of Romanesco broccoli has been made using a 3.2 gigapixel camera. The image is a test of a 64 centimeter wide detector made up of 189 CCDs that will be mounted on the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile to start operation in 2022. 
The detector will be used to survey the night sky for 10 years in excruciating detail. The camera will be able to image around 10 square degrees of sky in a single exposure and take an image every 15 seconds. It will image every flash, bang, snap, crackle and pop and improve our ability to track the movement of objects across the night sky. Hopefully this will help us develop a better understanding on our path to figure out this whole dark matter thing. Sadly, it is a ground-based observatory and the team will expect some problems due to the fact that the Dark Lord and legendary dickhead Elon Musk thought it would be a fun idea to launch a mega constellation of satellites. Now, in fairness to he who must not be named, he has set up a team to try to eliminate the issue, something which can't be said for other companies who tried the same thing, like OneWeb. I suppose that going bankrupt doesn't really help. Of course, there is a whole quagmire of other nonsense around OneWeb, but that gets a bit silly and political. Some of you may be aware that there is this virus thing going around, and this is receiving a bit of media attention. Of course, scientists are looking for a vaccine to see if we can get this virus to, well, stop killing people. One of the more promising vaccines so far has been Chadox-1, developed in collaboration between Oxford University and AstraZeneca. It is currently in phase 3 trials, but that had to be stopped because one of the 30,000 participants has fallen ill. It is very important to stress that this is a standard procedure. In fact, this is quite common in large trials and an important part of ensuring the safety of trial participants. The key objective at that point would be to establish whether the illness is linked to the vaccine or not. Once that has been established, the trial will be reviewed by the UK Medicines, Healthcare, Products and Regulatory Agency before it can start again. The investigation has actually been completed and has shown that the illness is not linked to the vaccine and the trial was restarted on Monday. If you are like me and you thought that there was a silver lining to COVID-19 as it would reduce CO2 emissions and therefore environmental impact, well, think again. Yes, there has been a decrease in CO2 emissions. The biggest decrease was in April, which was down by 17% compared to 2019. This just bumped up to just below 5% less in June compared to last year. It is expected that the overall drop will be between 4 and 7%. However, the half-life of CO2 in the atmosphere is about 27 years, which means that the change over one year has little impact. In fact, this will mean that the CO2 concentration at the end of 2020 will still be higher than it was at the start. Once again, the summer in the Northern Hemisphere has been an absolute bastard by breaking several new temperature records and, of course, the prized highest temperature ever recorded. Now, the long-standing record was set in 1913 in Death Valley, California at a lovely 56.7 Celsius or 139.9 Fahrenheit for you heathens. However, this is in dispute, so the officially recognized record is shared between Death Valley and Mitrobo in Kuwait at 54 Celsius or 129.2 Fahrenheit. Now, Death Valley will no longer need to share this as it has just set a new record of 54.4 Celsius or 129.9 Fahrenheit measured at Furnace Creek on August of 13th this year. To make you really cheerful for our future, a recent survey has also shown that the Thwaites Glacier in the Antarctic is losing ice at a rate of 80 billion tons per year. In the 90s, this was just 10 billion tons. It looks like this little fucker will break off, and this would mean that it can travel north, melt rapidly, and increase sea levels by 65 centimeters. On the bright side, it doesn't actually look like this will happen anytime soon. Finally, we have the exciting story of life on Venus, or more like evidence that life could exist on Venus, or even better, possible evidence that life could exist on Venus. This follows the publication of a paper in Nature Astronomy describing the detection of phosphine gas in the atmosphere. The gas was detected in two separate observations using the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii and ALMA in Chile, and the interdisciplinary collaboration between a number of different institutions across different disciplines. The phosphine was detected through absorption lines at the 1mm wavelength. The exciting thing about this detection is that the only mechanism that we know of that can produce the levels of phosphine that the team observed are heavy industrial processes and life. Now there aren't many factories on Venus which rules out the former option. So the question then becomes what process other than life could be responsible for this much phosphine? 
The issue is that Venus is not exactly a hospitable place with ridiculous surface temperatures and acid clouds, so life is pretty unlikely. And the paper is really more a request to the wider community to look into the matter and find alternative explanations and possibly enhance effort to send more probes to the planet so we can figure out where this phosphine is coming from before we accept that it could be life. So that was it for now. I know that Nerdline News was a feature that lots of people enjoyed, and I'm sorry that I didn't keep it up. Things got messy on my end, and not much was happening during the lockdown aside from coronavirus stuff. Of course, there was some exciting SpaceX stuff, but that involves Elon Musk, and he's a dick who gets enough airtime anyway. Hopefully, some more cool stuff will come out, and I can report on it. Not only do I enjoy doing Nerdline News, it's actually also quite an easy video. I think it would be really cool to expand this whole Nerdline News thing. So if you come across something that you think I should cover, please send it to me. And also, if you are a creator and would like to contribute to a segment, let me know. I know that chemistry, biology, medicine, and psychology are horribly underrepresented in this. So I would like to invite specialists in those fields to contribute more. Um, more physicists and notably climate scientists would also be very welcome. The idea would really just be that you do a short segment of any length on any newsworthy story in your field and work it into the presentation. It would be awesome to get some more nerds involved. If you're up for it, then you can find my email in the About tab of my channel or in the description of this video. Anyway, thank you all for popping along and a special thanks to my patrons. I've had a few requests for setting up uh, some system for one-off donations which you can now do on my Ko-fi page, and the link will be in the description. But please, please consider local community resilience initiatives first. Things aren't going great, and your real-life community probably needs it more. But thank you all for watching, and until next time.